the notice of intent, request for determination of activity. The commission will also be voting on decisions taking up other business. The no hearing times have been starting. assigned to the spe specific agenda items, and the commission will take them up in the order they are listed. Discussion and action items may be taken up at any time. In accordance with the Commonwealth of Massachusetts executive order su suspending provisions of the opening meeting law, we are conducting this meeting online. The commission welcomes participation in the meeting by the applicants and general public. Attending the meeting tonight are all six conservation members, Eric Foley, Marilyn Frank, Margaret Wheeler, Ann Jeffries, and Jim Gazzo, and myself, Peter Mullen. This meeting is being recorded by Western Cable Access Television. We respectfully ask that everyone mute their computer microphones and phones when they are not in use to avoid unnecessary noise during the meeting. This is an open meeting, so all panelists who have access to the chat panel, please only use chat for technical issues related to the video conference. The commission will proceed by opening the agenda items, having the applicant or the representative present the project or previously open in a public meeting, they will provide a brief summary of the project. The commission and staff will follow the questions and then we'll open it up to the public for questions and comments. At this point, if you wish to participate, you will raise your hand and your microphone will be unmuted for you to participate. Due to the limitations of the platform, attendee, attendees that are accessing the meeting via the telephone number at the top of the agenda will only be able to listen to the proceedings and will not be able to contribute. Please access the video conference via the link on the agenda, even if you don't have a webcam to participate. Uh, roll call. Uh, Eric, you there? Here. Uh, Jim? Here. Margaret? Here. Marilyn? Yes. Ann? Yes. And Peter, yes. Okay, our first agenda item is open forum. Uh, members of the commission have anything for open forum? None? Uh, no. Carol? Uh oh, I just lost my answer. You're muted. You're muted, yeah. Sorry, sorry, I was muted. Um, so I wanted to let you know that there's going to be a project happening within the next week or so starting on Kersey Circle. It's a water main um, replacement project. It's something that'll happen all season, all through the summer, probably until November. And then they'll probably come back and be paving in um, next spring. It met the criteria of an exemption under the Wetlands Act and under our bylaw for maintenance of you know, utility. So we did participate in their pre-construction meeting today. They will be using straw wattles. They were, you know, they'll be in touch if there's any issues for conservation, but um, they didn't have to do a filing. And I am gonna issue um, an emergency order for Summer Village to do the rest of the clearing and cutting of the um, trees. Most of them are down to the base, to the stump. There's a couple that had flipped up into the, um, you know, it completely, the root system had completely come up out of the ground. And in a couple of, in there was like, I think 17 and 21 water view. Um, it created some big holes in the ground right around their patios and kind of livable space. So they are gonna take the roots out of that and stabilize that area. Um, the rest of it's pretty much just the trees that either had already been damaged that they, they didn't take out under that first phase because they were doing um they were having an outside insurance company check everything out for them and then the other thing i wanted to mention was um we did get approval to be able to pay membership fees for macc and i just wanted to make sure you were interested in still participating because i can put that roster through yes sorry i'm concerned yes. Okay. Um, I think that's good. It, we, there's, there's always other things I could talk about, but why don't we, I'll let you get to the meeting. Okay. Uh, are there any, anything from open forum from uh, the audience? I don't see anything. Okay. So let's move on to our first agenda item, which is a um, public hearing for the Byrne family about irrevocable trust first 54 elm road this is a legal notice under massachusetts general law chapter 131 section 40 the wetlands protection act and the wetlands non-zoning wetlands bylaw chapter 171. the western conservation commission will have a public hearing on wednesday july 8, 2000 
20 at 7.30 p.m. a remote participation on the notice of intent application of the Byrne Family Irrevocable Trust for after the fact approval for the existing dock and changing stead and proposed restoration of the beach area, including re replenishment of beach sand in and, without, in and within 100 feet of a resource area at 54 Elm Road. Okay, uh, welcome, who's here? Hi, how are you all? This is Stephen Byrne. Okay. So you just you want to just give us a general uh, thing of what of what your project was and what you've done. Uh, basically, we just have a replaced dock. Uh, it's an eco-friendly dock system we bought off Scott McKay over there at the uh, hardware store by the Western Regency. It's an aluminum docking system. Uh, the way it's fastened to the ground is it has aluminum poles that sit on a six by six aluminum plate. Basically, the pole drives into the sand itself about four to six inches, depending on where you have it set. Um, it sits on the shoreline where it's non fastened. It's just loose because we do take it out in the winter so it isn't damaged by the ice. Uh, you know, frost heats and stuff like that. So it sits onto the property where the old dock was uh, years and years ago. Um, also, over the past few years, we've had a lot of beach erosion due from the bigger wakes coming off some of the boats out there, which is not an issue, but there's a lot of uh, like roots and stuff like that showing that the kids seem to trip over. And we're just looking to more or less replenish that uh, a little further up as well where it was years ago. But I guess maybe rainwater over the time has kind of brought it back into the lake and it eroded away. So just more or less looking to replenish um, some of the existing sand so it's a little more comfortable and not tripping over roots. Um, as the shed goes, uh, it's a, uh, you know, just a, a small changing shed that we've had there for uh, quite some time now. It more or less has the uh, kids' snacks, kids' floats, bathing suits, stuff like that. I do keep the key to my boat in there as well, uh, so it's not misplaced. And uh, that's really about it. Okay, uh, questions from the commission? So I'm assuming it needs a Chapter 91 license from a state, or does he have that? He was going to look into it, I thought, right? But nobody had it. Yeah. This is a different one, Jim. I don't think, um, Steve, I don't know if you have one at this time, but um, you could apply for one. Is, is that correct? And what is that for? Is it Chapter 91? Um, so waterways is a different division of the DEP, and if you're on a great pond, they do require um, a license for docks and piers. Okay. That's fine. Whatever we need to do. Um, as far as the beach nourishment, um, any idea how many cubic yards or tons of material and what you would be looking to bring in as part of that restoration? I'm thinking realistically, I'm probably looking at about, I think, two yards the most. It's not very much. Yeah, no, so, and that's it. We're not looking to do a, a large area, just more or less kind of cover the roots and stuff like that along the shoreline and, uh, you know, replenish it. There is existing sand there now, so we don't need large amounts of it in a lot of areas, just a little bit, you know, kind of just a refluff it. How would you get it in there? Uh, I would have it delivered probably from the gentleman. Um, it, what is it called? Uh, mulch, the mulch doctor, I believe. They have a small, uh, F-350 dump truck I've seen run around town. So I'd imagine they just back it down and dump it. Then I would spread it manually by wheelbarrow and uh, shovel. They could actually back it down to the location? Yes, sir. I got no other questions, Peter. OK. Anybody else have questions? Margaret? Yes. Yes. So Steve, you talked a little bit about rain potentially being part of what washes the sand into the pond. Do you see um, any places on the site where it looks like that has happened? You know, water running from um, upslope down across the beach, you know, someplace where um, there could be plantings or stuff that would divert the water away from the beach so you minimize how much sand you lose? 
Um, it's not so much up on the top. I'd say most of the erosion takes place from the wake boats that are on the lake now. They do cast a pretty good sized wake and stuff like that. So I'd say, you know, as, as they become more popular over the past few years, we've noticed it's just kind of protruding upwards. Um, I, I'd say not so much rain, you know, washing stuff away. I was just saying. Okay. No, it's just, yeah. And, and I'm just looking for opportunities to kind of. Um, you know, while you're doing the work to, to minimize how much sand you lose. Now, um, are you using, when you're, when your family goes into the water, are they doing it along the entire shoreline or potentially could you place rocks at certain points that might kind of act as a breakwater to prevent damage by the wash from the boats? Um, in this particular beach area, it's only a small beach access, we'll call it. Uh, there is a stone wall, like a natural made stone wall along the other area of the property line. But this particular beach area that we use, it's probably about, I'd say, I'm going to be generous at saying 10 feet. And uh, that way, they, they, it, it would interfere, you know, any type of wall with accessing in and out of the water. The, right now, it's more or less a natural slope where it okay. eventually turns into uh, soil and uh, grass. Okay. Um, also, from looking at the diagram, it doesn't show how far the shed is set back from the edge of the the pond of the, the lake. Um, I'd say you're I'd say you're about an easy fifteen feet. Okay. Um, <laughs> Maybe twenty feet. Fifteen to twenty feet, realistically. Okay. Because one of the things that I was was looking at with that is normally the commission. Um, basically asked to have you know we set the 30 feet as a no disturb and we understand that with the beach that's different but um one of my thoughts had been to move that shed farther back from the edge of the um the lake and i don't know what other commission members think the reason it's where it is is because there's a lot of trees and stuff like that and we absolutely hate to cut down any trees we love the privacy and the shade which kind of makes the lot as unique as it is and where it's set is basically it's it's abutting the trees right behind it which was where it is um you know like i said it, it, it's probably more like 20 feet cow's been out to the site so maybe she can clear it up with a, a better guesstimation of uh, how many feet it is exactly but she'll understand what i'm saying by the uh the natural trees that are there is the reason it's placed where it was we didn't want to interfere or cut anything down I, I was at the site. I guess the only thing I guess I would say, Steve, is like where you had your tent area, you know, or your canopy. So for the commission, there's no house on the lot. It's just a, it's an empty lot. Um, I don't know whether it could be like you could put your tent area closer, which is just temporary. And then the shed could be back a little further. I don't know the distance. We didn't measure it, Margaret. Okay. It's 40 feet. It's 40 feet. It's not 40 feet. Um, you know, it's we're asking for the commission if we could just be, you know, maybe, you know, a, a variance or whatnot is it's 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 my parents had it built there. They they had a reputable company come out and do it. Um, you know, they did go down and they spoke to the previous building commissioner back in 2015, where he had told them that, you know, at the time he said, as long as it's under 120 square feet, you do not need a, uh, a permit. So they were just more or less thinking that what they did was perfectly fine. Um, and you know, it, it is quite a bit of work to move it where it, it sits on cinder blocks. It's not a poured foundation or anything like that, but it is set up on on cinder blocks where they have put, you know, PVC lattice work underneath it and stuff. And it's to the size where, you know, you would probably have to either pay somebody to come in and dismantle it, which would be quite costly, or somehow, I don't know, jack it up and roll it. It, it would be quite a bit of work to move it just a few feet. So if maybe the commission could help us out in that aspect, it would be much appreciated. Any other questions? How, about how far it is? Yeah, we could measure how far it is. I mean, one thing I was gonna just add about the lot is, is compared to a lot of the lots, there's not much imperviousness on the site. And most of it's either grass, gravel, or wooded. And um, the whole, most of the shoreline, other than the small section where the dock is and the beach, which is was, is pretty much like ten feet, um, you know, it's all wooded shrubs along the the coast, the shoreline. Okay. 
Um, any other uh, comments from the commission? Uh, any comments from the uh, audience? Uh, you have I don't a hand raised, it. I believe. Yeah, I can't. I'm not seeing it. Um, Matt, can you can you click on that? Yep, I will. I'm locked up. Uh, Mr. O'Neill. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Am I muted? No, you're good. good. Can you hear yep. me? Oh, you can hear me. Yep. Okay. Uh, yeah. The um, the shed is probably about ten feet from the shore, um, and uh, there are no tree. The trees. There's only trees on the borders of the property, the borderline. The rest of the property has no trees on it, so there wouldn't be any problem in setting that back thirty feet. Um, as far as Chapter ninety one goes, there's a lot of problems here. Uh, first of all, uh, the the um, the chief of the um, Daniel Padium of the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection Waterways Program has been trying to contact Steve Burns a number of times. He refuses to re return the phone calls, and uh, he refuses to uh, to uh, contact him. He's been told uh, a number of times. He was told last year that he had to first of all. He has to get a letter of intent from the conservation committee to start this chapter 91 process. He has a mooring, a mooring line and a raft in front of my house. I've got pictures of it from the water. I have pictures of it from the shore and I have pictures of it from the, they're right on the property line. You can see it. The mooring is 100% on my property. The mooring line, the dock, is all part and parcel it needs to be permitted. First of all, you need he needs a letter of intent from the conservation committee, and then that goes forward to the state. Uh, in the meantime, this trampoline, raft, mooring, and mooring line is in front of my house, okay? And um, all this stuff needs to be permitted. I, you know, I personally, I, I want the stuff out of the water until he goes through the proper processes and gets these things permitted and they're in line with what the, the, the state uh, wants him to do. Um, he's known for a long time. He's a contractor. Um, he knows, he stated in his application process that uh, he was not aware that he needed a permit for the dock. He's been aware for the last year. I told him last year, he's had the dock in there for a number of years and he needed permits for that. And the mooring, he just put on my property on Memorial Day weekend when my, my wife and I were not at home and he and a friend of his plunked it in our front yard. And basically our property lines per chapter 91, they extend out into the water. The state of Massachusetts owns the, the land underneath the water, but we have permit rights um, and our, our, our property lines extend actually 25% out into the water. That area, we can file permits and have moorings put in and, and all of those things, and we can charge for that. This mooring has been placed in my front yard, um, and I, I want it out of there as, as, as soon as possible. And I think the dock and the boat should be out of there until he gets the proper permitting. Um, the shed, I would agree, yes, it, it should be set back uh at, at least 30 feet um, um there's also last july there were uh loads and loads and loads of gravel dumped in that uh piece of property no permits as far as i understand and this was a i think there's a possible uh storm water management problem here because the water used to come down the hill it flowed through that property and into the lake. Now the water flows down the hill because he put all the gravel and the stones and, and stuff in there. It flows now into my property and actually floods my septic. So I've got major problems with that. This used to be a non-buildable lot where the water came down the hill and rushed through out into the lake. And uh, also talking to the uh, commissioner of uh, the waterway program, the chief of the program he saw an overhead view of the sand and the lake and he wasn't real happy with that 
Um, and he talked about that, but he was also going to talk to Steve Burns further on that. But Steve doesn't return the phone calls. He's never, you know, never contacted him. Uh, the, um, so I have a problem with the mooring. I have a problem with the shed. I think the, the letters of intents have to go out from the from the conservation committee. And that starts the process with Daniel Padian. Uh, and you know, it's it's the thing is these right now are public nuisances. This thing's in my front yard. It can't be there. I mean, I can decide myself whether I he has to contact the abutters. There's a whole process that goes with this. And if he doesn't follow the process, what is it? It's a public nuisance, and it's right in Chapter 91. It's right in the general laws of the state of Massachusetts, and that's what well, it is. Okay, okay. I think that's enough. I think we've had plenty of input from you. Uh, we have no jurisdiction over where that mooring is. Okay, absolutely none. It not, has nothing to do with us. We we can approve his placement of the dock, and then he has to get the Chapter 91 uh, license from the state. We're going to have Carol go out and check the shed situation to see if it can be moved farther back. She'll also check out this so-called pulling of the gravel, uh, and uh, we'll continue this to our next meeting. So, Peter, if he has to get his Chapter 91 license, are we going to have him remove his dock until he gets it? Well, we've never done that before, have we? No. So, he's got to get the Chapter 1, the Chapter 91. So, uh, so we'll put it in the order. How long do we allow him? How much time do we give him before he has to obtain it? Because we can write that we can write that into the order of conditions, okay. give him 90 days to obtain the license, or you know, we'll revoke the uh, the our, the permission to have the dock. Then he can take it out. I mean, that's what we've done in the past, basically. So, but for yeah. now, we're you know, for now, Carol's going to get back out there and relook at the site. Okay. And the only thing I, I the only thing I'd say about the time frame is DEP is still not working um, in their offices. I don't know about the ninety chapter ninety one program, but I know the well right. in, in Nero. So just with um, the way the governor's executive order was written, I'm not sure if that time frame would apply the same way. We just have to be careful about that. Okay, well, we'll do that. I mean, we're not even ready to write the order yet because we need you to go back out there and just relook at the whole situation. Yep, that's fine. And okay, Carol, so we'll keep working for the department and we're getting our work done. Well, I'm not saying okay. you're not getting the work done. I just <laughs> you don't have to do certain things. You don't have to act within certain time frames. So if they didn't, I know. You know, that could be an issue. They've been given extensions on certain permits. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, Peter, I, I, get, I don't know if Steve had anything more you wanted to say about the gravel. It was my understanding that there had been gravel on the lot. So I'm not sure if that's um, from aerial photography. It looked like there had been gravel on the lot for quite some time. Is that right? Okay. Well, anyway, so we need you to go back out there and just look yep. at it one more time for us, okay? Yep, that's fine. Okay. So we'll continue this to our uh, July 22nd meeting uh, after Carol gets back out there. Marilyn? All, all in favor, Eric? Yes. Uh, Jim? Marilyn? Yes. Uh, Margaret? Yes. Ann? Yes. Peter, yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. We'll talk to you guys on the 22nd. Have a good night. Yep. Okay. Yep. Okay, we're going to move on to our next agenda item, which is the continuation of a public hearing for Virgil Run 65 Powers Road, 3341746. Applicant has requested to continue the hearing without discussion to July 22nd. Can I have a motion to that effect? So moved. Second. All in favor? Eric? Yes. Uh, Jim? Margaret? Yes. Marilyn? Yes. Ian? Yes. Peter? Yes. Okay, we're going to move on to our next agenda item, which is the continuation of a public hearing for GMH Realty LLC, 124 Main Street, for an ANRAD, 3341748. Matt, you there? I am. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, Matt Waterman with Land Tech Consultants on behalf of GMH Realty LLC. Um, I also know that Leslie Toddy, um, Thomas 
is a panelist and I think wants to say something towards the end of my introduction. Um, at our last meeting was June 24th. Uh, we covered a lot of ground, a lot of information with presenting the application. Um, we had had a site walk just before that on the 17th. We went back out on the day after our last meeting with Carol. We had rehung some flags and um, had our surveyors locate some additional flags that were hung. Um, we also have been providing the commission some additional information. Um, Carol did receive some information today, so I don't expect that she'll be able to speak to the, the, the updated plan. I was late in getting that back to her with the holiday weekend. Um, but I know what did make it into your packets was we updated um, the riverfront information um, that was presented in Appendix B of the Notice of Intent Report. Um, we provided additional photos um, going back through all of my emails and, and copying photos over. I had missed a couple days worth of photos. I coordinated that um, directly with Carol. I believe she can speak to that if she had any issues. Um, we'd also submitted a video kind of before our last meeting um, that hopefully um, Carol and, and or company has had a chance to review. Um, again, we did submit a revised plan that moved a couple flags around. Nothing pertinent um, to the discussion, but um, just for accuracy, that was provided today. And I, I, I guess before I turn it over to Leslie Thomas, I just wanted to reiterate, I know there was a lot of focus on the, the riverfront last meeting and when we talked about the stream stats, and I haven't heard from Carol on whether engineering had reviewed it yet, but I just think it's important that we go through the the technical requirements of the stream stats. I touched on them quickly at the last meeting, and you know, there's basically three categories of stream stats. You know, less than 0.5 square miles, 0.5 square miles to one square mile, and greater than one square mile. Um, when you're less than 0.5, it's kind of just, you know, up to the discretion of the board whether they consider it intermittent. And then the larger the watershed size, um, the commission has, you know, has to, has to probably consider more preponderance of evidence whether it's they consider it intermittent or not. Um, when you're going from 0.5 to 1, and then if you're greater than one square mile, it's assumed to be perennial. Um, with those three categories, we're fit into the less than 0.5 square miles and we're 0 0.06 square miles. So our watershed is significantly less than the threshold. And I just wanted to reiterate that because I think it's important. Um, I'll turn it over to Leslie Thomas. She was taking most of the photographs and I know that she just wanted to speak to the commission. Can you hear me? Yep. Um, thank you for uh, um, allowing me to speak, but um, I did hazardous duty taking these photos. Um, Carol, you must know climbing down, but I went um, for several days um, and I took them with my phone, so everything was recorded. But I went on September 27th of 2019, October 2nd, and um, it did rain um, the day before I went on October 2nd, and then October 5th, October 9th, October 16th. Um, and the 17th, um, but, well, and the last one is when you all went on June 17th. But what I can tell you is I think this is, um, and I took them showing those granite um, monuments are the right side of the property is orange and the left side of the property is pink. And so I took them from the same point each time. And basically there were, in every instance when I went there, there was a little bit of water sitting. It's very, very low there. And the elevation from the right to the left is very flat um, on this area. And this area runs along the on all the lots on Douglas Road, along the back of the lots on Douglas Road. Um, and I think typical of what developers used to do back then, having been on the planning board for 10 years, is they made a drainage area when they um, had a problem. and it looks like most of the water that comes into this area comes from the houses that are built on Douglas Road. And in fact, many of them have 
PVC piping coming from the basements into that area. Um, the Hicks property is much higher on the other side and it's much further away. Um, I did go to look at all of the GIS maps and the houses on Douglas um, vary from, uh, there's uh, one or two at 25 feet, a uh, couple at 50 feet, some at 100 feet, and one a little bit more away from that, um, from actually the center of that uh, drainage area. Um, on the other side, this property is quite a, much further away from that. Um, I don't know, Matt, do you know um, on the proposed uh, house, house plans for that parcel, how close the back of the house is to the brook? No, and, and there's and this application is for the property as a whole. Um, as we discussed at the last oh, meeting, okay. it's been mm -hmm. subdivided into six lots, six right. single family houses. One of the lots um, where the Hicks's house is is currently under an application to convert it to to two units, possibly three units. Um, and that's the only lot. That's where the house where the 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 original office is. And the 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 original house, which is lot four, comes the closest um, to the back, and it I want to say it comes into the riverfront probably by about 50 feet, as as shown on plans that we're presenting to the zoning board of appeals. Um, but with respect to the other lots, um, the conceptual layouts that at least were depicted on A and R plan and 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 our conceptual plans all the houses and septics were out closer to the road, Main Street, um, right. with the septics right along Main Street, um, as far away from the, the resource area as possible. That is correct. I think most of them met the, uh, met the setback um, from, uh, from the, you know, brook. But um, the fact that it was, you know, there's, even if there's water in there, it probably just sits and seeps down because the it's the elevation is such that it's, it's quite flat all the way down there it um, doesn't really move much and I don't know where it goes it doesn't seem to flow into anything um, and it certainly doesn't flow to the right because that's a higher elevation um, on the lots but um, you know I did very carefully look and trumps all the way down there in that muck and mess. And um, it basically is damp there. The lot that this property abuts on the right-hand side, which is, um, I forgot the number, I think it's, uh, 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 it'll be 13, I think it's 15 um, Douglas Road. But the, the uh, lot that abuts the property to the right, which has frontage on Douglas, um, has a swampy area there, which I think you see in the, so the most of the water that seemed to be, any water that seemed to be there seemed to be in that wet area on that uh, lot, which is um, parcel 27-135. And that's where the granite bound is um, with the um, orange ribbon on it. It's hard to tell in the photos. Uh, Matt, your copier isn't doing great with my photos, so I'll have to say. <laughs> they all look very dark, but um, if you see them, and I'd be happy to email them, um, you can see that it's mostly, you know, leaves and uh, and stuff like that, but no water moving from the whole time I went. Okay, you all set? Um, Carol, you want, you want to just bring us up today to what you heard from DEP? Well, let me start with engineering first. Um, sure, I, did, I did send the information to engineering and when we they were reviewing it and we had discussion, one of the things we realized, and I did confirm this with DEP, is that the Wetlands Act presumes, if it's shown as a perennial stream on the USGS map, which this stream is, it is presumed to be perennial. And if you go to the sections that allow you to try to overcome that, overcome that. the only way you're trying you overcome it is with the photographs so the stream stats is used only to determine if you're 
trying to call an intermittent stream perennial. It's not used to overcome the presumption that a perennial stream is intermittent. So I think DEP agrees in that with that interpretation. Um, and it's it's in the MACC handbook as well. So we wouldn't be using the stream stats basically for overcoming the presumption. I did ask DEP if they could help me to give you further information about what I was seeing on the site, which was that there were dry areas as shown by Leslie's photographs and what I observed in the field, both before the drought was established and after the drought. But there were places where there was water flowing. I saw water flowing. And there were places where there was substantial water um, ponded and puddling. And that was really most of the area behind the lots, except for at that headwater spot on the south side and where it went into that wetland on the north side. <laughs> so unfortunately, I did not hear back from them um, with anything more to help give further guidance today. But um, the, I talked with the circuit rider and she was reaching out to one of the analysts who is um, is really kind of the go-to person for riverfront questions. So that's the update I have um, on the riverfront and on the stream flow. I think part of the question is, is you know, can the stream be considered perennial in places where we see flow or, or, or water? Um, and possibly it's not perennial because it goes into the ground in other places. So that's kind of my question with them. Um, as far as Matt, like Matt talked about with the wetland delineation, I didn't review the plan um, that I received today, um, but it, I expect it picks up the areas that I had asked them to incorporate as part of BVW, and um, and then we did double check some of the flags that had been missing. So I, I do expect that that will be accurate and fine. Um, so it's still really just a question on where we think the stream might be perennial and and uh okay that's yeah well so, so excuse we do me expect Peter, can I ask the question? then right carol i'm sorry somebody else is trying to talk you, to you you do expect to hear back from dep again i hope so the circuit rider did send an email today to one of their analysts and it was kind of late in the <laughs> afternoon so i just i didn't hear today Okay. Any any other comments uh, from the commission? Uh, yes. Can you can you hear me? Yeah. Who's this? Yes. Mm -hmm. Jim. Jim, go ahead, Jim. Okay. Um, Carol, when you, you do talk to the circuit rider, I'd be curious if uh, they've ever seen a stream on a on a uh, topographic map that portions of it were were flowing and portions of it were dry and portions of it were damp because it looks like we have a combination of maybe parts of streams. Some wetlands and then some dry areas. That's right, and that's how she described it in the email to their analysts. Oh, okay. okay, good. Peter, could I ask a question? Yep, go ahead, Liza. Peter. Okay. Um, I think that a lot of what's contributing there are there are PVC pipes coming out from the houses on Duckless Road from their basements that pour water into that stream that are not part of it flowing from, you know, the right-hand side down to the left. And so I think that makes a makes a big difference. And I, I know, um, I don't know if uh, Matt mentioned that maybe Carol was going to address that issue with the um, abutters, but um, I think that's been going on for a long, from, since those houses were built. And um, so that contributes to, that's, where I think a lot of that water comes into the stream, and I think that's or the area, and I think that's why some areas are wetter than others. Well, you know, I, I think we have abutters here that are going to disagree with you. So, and, yeah, uh, I, know, I know at least one of them wants yeah. to hear. That, so that, that's it. Uh, any other okay. com, uh, commission you. members have anything to say? No. Okay, uh, Joseph uh, Vozeller is there. Joseph there? You're, no. uh, Mr. Bozella, you're muted. 
Can you hear me now? Yes, yes we can. Very good. Okay. So, so uh, it's first of all, you're right. There's a lot that Leslie said that I completely disagree with. Um, when I had my, I've, I've actually had um, two failures in my septic system, so I've replaced it twice, and both times is because the water table is very high in this area, right? And it's very likely the water type table is potentially contributing to the stream, but it is not people pushing water into, into the back of their properties. Um, it does seem to me that a lot of the decision here is based on photographs. And I just would want to kind of understand what do these photographs need to show? I mean, are they photographs in a similar area, or like, can you just walk the prop, walk the perimeter, and basically take any area where it's dry, or can, do you have to select it from a single point? Um, you want me to answer a little, Peter? Yeah, Carol, go ahead. I mean, I don't have the regulations in front of me, um, but it doesn't specifically say. It, and that's part of the part that's why we're looking for some further clarification. So it only says that there has to be, it has to be documented by a competent source that the stream is dry four times within a one year period and not within a drought period or not when it's um, been impeded by um, blockage in some other way. So the concern I have certainly with the with the designation of where these pictures are taken is one, the east side photos, if you stand where that demarcation is, you're standing in wetland, right? It's kind of like a meadow, but it is not the stream. The stream. Right. So I think you're in uh, that is something where I'm not sure those pictures were accurately taken. Uh, we've walked through the stream. Right. So, and did a video. All right. Yeah. So we, you know, we know where that stream goes and right where those pictures are taken, the the stream takes a very sharp turn. So I, I do think that those pictures are actually valid. Uh, the the west side, you're taking it at the very peak, the very beginning of that stream. So yes, it's probably opportunist that it's very it's very dry area and shallow. And these pictures were taken just before us going into a drought, and in the CMR three ten actually states that they recommend against taking pictures in the early fall time frame because it is typically the driest time of the year. And that's the appendix of right. the CMR. in the appendix of the CMR. So there's a lot of questions questions about the photos that were taken, and whether they actually meet the requirements. Okay, so Carol, when you were out there, you, did you, you were at that, that head wall on the east side. I mean, did you see, see the, the path of the stream there take a, a different turn? Did you see anything? Well, I won't dispute what he said because it was a shallow wetland area and you couldn't, I couldn't from where we were standing up on the top of the, um, bank area, I couldn't see if it was taking that sharp turn as he described. It has to turn um, to go under the culvert under Kersey, um, which is nowhere near where those photos were taken. So that you can see it even in the picture, the plan of land. Um, I don't know what to call it, but the wetlands is a separate area. And then the little dotted line banks sharply northeast. That's the stream that right, right goes at the, under yeah. Kersey Circle. Right at the Pijahitas. At the Pijahitas, yeah. Right on the line of Pijahita and Cusieri. So can we just ask Matt if he can show the center line of the stream if it's not shown on the plans? That would be helpful. Yeah, we can do that. And I do know that some of the photos were taken to show the bound for reference purposes. But I can assure you the photos at least the ones that I've been looking at do document the stream and the video that was taken documents the stream. And we walked the whole stream from, I know some of the photos where the bound is, is set back from the stream where the stream turns and goes under Kersey Circle. I'm not disputing that at no, all. No, Matt, there's a vegetation discrepancy. You photographed this sunny, reedy wetland meadow, um, and it should have been a marshy, skunk cabbage -y, um 
uh, like near the culvert. There's a vegetation difference. <clears throat> no, and, and I and I saw it. I, I walked through the wetlands, to, and there's there's actually another stream that comes in, or a channel, if you will, that comes in and meets where the the primary stream that we're talking about that runs behind the Hicks property and behind the Douglas Road properties turns and goes underneath Carlisle, or excuse me, Kersey Circle. And then there's another stream channel that comes in on the right. And then in the middle, where the bound is and where the wetland area is, there is flanked with skunk cabbage and that channel, there is heavy. Um, if you see our video and, and the photos, as soon as you get upgrading of that, it gets away from the cabbage and the it, it's more of a cobbly bottom. Yeah, you took one of the photos, right? I, that's the one that I think looks different from figures two through five. So, uh, Carol, um, do you think you should go back out in the site and meet with the abutters and Matt and, and go over this to make sure that it's clear where the stream channel is? Well, I can certainly do that, but we are in a drought, so we wouldn't be yeah. documenting flow at this point, but we could certainly look at that stream center line and make sure we're all on the same page with that. Correct. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about right okay. now. So. Yep. Okay. Probably a good idea. Is that okay with you, Matt? Yeah, no, I think that's a good idea, Peter. Okay, that will be great. Um, is that okay with you, um, Joseph? Uh, that's agreeable. Thank you. Okay. Very good. Okay. So, uh, Carol, can you think you can do that within the next two weeks? So, sure. Yep. And, okay. Um, any other questions? Oh, let me audience? just ask, um, yep. are the Mosellas, are they available during the day, just so I know? Yes. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Uh, not next week, but the following week, yes. Okay. Not next week. We okay. Leave this, for I, Saturday. Okay. Well, we'll schedule. Um, are you going to be using email if I try to do it by email? Yep, yes. Sure. Okay, my so I'll try to coordinate it by email. Okay. Thank you. Um, there's one more comment from the audience. Nan Walsh is there. Nan, are you there? Unmute yourself. Um, Okay, can you hear me now? <laughs> yes, we can hear you now, Nan. Yep. Just a quick, quick comment. I just wanted to concur with something that Mr. Vazella said, that it is indeed, uh, the water table here is uh, a real problem because I've had water in my basement since I moved in in 1971 until just a few years ago when I had to take some mitigation to stop that. I do not have PVC pipe, and yet every time it rained, the water table would rise into my basement. So just wanted to concur with what he said. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, it, um, Nan, it, you heard that Carol's going to be going out there and meeting with Matt and the uh, Bozellas. If you wanted to uh, tag along in that, you're probably quite welcome. Okay. Just let me know. Okay. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, I don't see any other comments from the audience. Uh, so we will continue this to our uh, July 22nd meeting. Mr. Chair, I see one hand raised uh, popped up right as you were asking. Okay, who is it? I, I'm not seeing it. Um, Mr. Shankar. Oh, okay, yeah. He's got a question, yeah. Uh, Ravi uh, Shankar, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, we can hear you. Go ahead. Yeah, I think... I had the same, we had the same issue in our place uh, subsequent to a remodel back in 2005. We were kind of surprised that we had a flooded basement all of a sudden and it had rained 11 inches that day, uh, that spring. But we thought it was just because of the spring rains, but it apparently the water table was way high to begin with because subsequently we had to install a pump uh after that no matter even if uh, it starts raining it kind of kicks, kicks in with just quarter inch rain it kicks it starts kicking in that means the water table is just below the basement <laughs> it's not okay. like very far off okay 
So you heard us that, that Carol's going to be going out there and and uh, and meeting with Matt Waterman and and, and the other about his uh, to go over the stream channel. Okay. 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 Great. So um, I don't have everyone's email, so can I just go through the Vazellas and maybe they can reach out to other people when we come up with a time? Okay. Is, it, is, is that all right with you, Joseph? It, sir, it certainly is. Okay, great. Okay. So um, do I have a motion to continue this to uh, July 22nd? I move. Second. Okay. All in favor, Eric? Yes. Uh, Jim? Yes. Uh, Margaret? Yes. Marilyn? Yes. Ian? Yes. Peter? Yes. Okay, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, everyone. Yep. Okay, we're going to move on to our next agenda item, which is the continuation of a public hearing and issue order of conditions for Kez Kep Methody at 97 and a half Dunstable Road. Are uh, you there? Yes, this is James Kaskamethi. Good evening, Commissioner. Yep. Uh, so June okay. 24th. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. So uh, does the commission have any questions on this? No. Uh, James, do you have any questions on the order of conditions? No, I do not. Thank you, Carol, for getting that over to me. Okay, great. Um, I, just, I wanted to, Peter. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Go ahead. One one question. I'm, I'm think I, this is the one I, I read and I understood. I want to make sure that um, there's going to be some discussion about what um, erosion control measures are going to be put in, whether it's water bars or something else, uh, before it, it gets uh, approved as a project, right? So there is a condition, Jim, condition 23, the applicant shall install fl flow mitigation measures to prevent erosion of the replenished fee stand. The proposed okay. measures shall be approved by the commission or its agent prior to installation. Got it. That's good. Okay. Okay. Uh, motion to, motion to so, approve it. Peter? Yeah. I'm sorry, Mark. Uh, yeah. yeah, I just had sent Carol um, a clarification because in the second finding where it talks about the dock can be removed easily, but condition 28 says it will be. That um, for consistency, I want um, I suggested that the finding be modified to say that the dock will be removed for the for the winter months, so that there's there's no difference between the language of the two conditions, or between the finding and the condition. Okay. And any any other comments? So can I have a, a motion to approve the order conditions as modified? Second. Second. All in favor, Eric? Yes. Jim? Yes. Margaret? Yes. Marilyn? Yes. Ann? Yes. Peter, yes. Uh, motion to close the public hearing? Second. Second. All in favor, Eric? Yes. Jim? Yes. Margaret? Yes. Marilyn? Yes. Ann? Yes. Peter, yes. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Commission, very much. Okay, we're moving on to our next agenda item, which is a continuation of a public hearing for the Westwood Ten Tennis Center for Littleton Road, 3341712. Uh, Doug, you there? Yes, I oh, <clears throat> Yes, I am. Okay, you're on. Uh, good evening. For the record, um, Douglas DeShane representing um, the applicant uh, on the phone this evening, uh, Mike Sheehan and um, Matt Hammer, our engineer. The board will recall that at the last meeting, well, we discussed, uh, well, one, we wrapped up some orders of uh, certificates of compliance, which was great, a lot of work and a lot of time. We appreciate your, your efforts in that. Um, but we also discussed amending our current notice of intent to include only uh, completion of the infill areas 
uh, and we removed our proposed addition. Uh, Matt also revised the plan to reflect uh, not only the infill work, only the infill work, but also modified the proposed compensatory storage areas to include only areas being impacted by the infill work. So as you recall, it used to have might be much larger because it took into consideration the addition, but that's all been pulled off. Um, we have also provided notice uh, to the DEP of this change uh, and a copy of the revised plan. And I, Carol, I'm sure the commission, if you haven't got it, you'll receive, a, we copied you guys on that as well, but um, we have amended the plan and provided DEP of notice of that. And then Carol was kind enough to provide us some um, feedback on the plans um and and some she had some questions so i just there's only four i just want to run through them quick uh one um i know carol had the compensatory storage area calculations reviewed by town engineer to make sure they were correct and i'll, I'll let carol report on that um secondly uh carol wanted to verify that the wetland lines shown on this plan uh, were in fact reflective of the recent flagging done by Steve Erickson from Norse Environmental uh, back in February. When Carol and Steve were out there in May reviewing the line, um, they noticed that a couple of the flags uh, adjacent to the parking lot uh, didn't appear to have been either moved or modified. And Carol wanted to make sure that our plan reflected the original line done by Steve. So I. I talked with Matt and who talked with Steve. Um, yes, this line is reflective of the flags that were in place in February. In fact, Matt went out and surveyed them within a day or two of Steve hanging them. So if there had been some flags moved, and Carol, I, I we talked about that. I looked at that into that. We're thinking that maybe when the, the trees were planted, maybe that's when the flags were moved. I, we're not sure. But I did verify that this reflects the flagging done by Steve in February. So um, it is accurate as to the site. Um, the third question, um, we had not provided sufficient detail on how we were going to stabilize and naturalize that compensatory storage area once we built it. Um, and again, followed up on that, I spoke with Matt. Um, our intention, because that is currently a grass and paved, uh, excuse me, grass, loamed and grassed area, as you know, to make the compensatory storage, we're going to lower the elevation in that area. So our plan would be to re-loam and reseed it. However, uh, we're certainly willing to commit to provide to Carol a quick little landscaping plan for that before we, uh, you know, for her review or the board's review before we finalize the, the, that um, compensatory storage area. But I, I will say it's not gonna be a very um, um, elaborate plan. It's gonna be some loam and seed it, get it back to grass. It'll just have a depression uh, where it didn't before. Uh, and the last question, we have shown uh, straw wattles uh, for erosion control around the compensatory storage area. And uh, we were reminded that the commission prefers uh, a combination of hay bed, uh, excuse me, wattles and silt fence. So we will certainly update this plan uh, to provide for the um, uh, the silt fence. Sorry. So I think we. Um, I, I know Matt did a good job of um, removing everything except for this work on the infills. We've adjusted everything accordingly. And again, I know Carol had the compensatory storage stuff checked, but um, uh, other than that, we're happy to answer any questions you have, or if the commission would like to see additional changes or upgrades, uh, you know, at this point, we're willing to, to do whatever it takes to get this uh, finalized. I know we've been, we're all been working on this for a long time. So we hope we can, uh, we can get to the end here. Okay, Carol. Okay, so um, I had sent basically those those questions in some format to Doug. I have a couple of follow ups of both questions and comments on um, on what he respond he's um, addressed. So 
The compensatory, compensatory storage calculations, um, I still want to just to clarify with Matt Hammer, um, when engineering was looking at it, the second infill area, the area closest to Littleton Road, could you just confirm, because there's not very many spot elevations, that none of that area is in the floodplain? It wasn't completely clear whether that was the case. Yes, yeah, so if you'll notice on the um, on the infill that was previously approved uh, adjacent to Littleton Road, there's a full frost wall that um, was installed years ago that starts at the structure and terminates at the structure. Um, so that wall is um, is a foot higher than the, um, the floodplain. So that's why you see the FEMA line that comes in where the compensatory storage area is and it terminates at that frost wall. The reason why um, this compensatory storage related to the infill in the rear is because the frost wall that was supposed to go in in the rear years ago never was installed. So there were spot shots within that infill area that technically were in the floodplain. Okay, so if the commission's satisfied with that, you know, at this stage, the frost wall's there, you, it wasn't required for compensatory storage back when it was put in. Um, I don't know if it was put in floodplain initially or not, but it is the condition today. Um, and then I'm still not 100% sure that I'm completely understanding on the wetland delineation. So it's true what Doug said. When Steve and I went there, there were a couple of flags that were, that Steve thought had been moved. That wouldn't have been when the trees were planted because the trees were planted after that. But, okay. um, or you mean, maybe, you mean, I, anyway, between February and May, I'm not quite sure what happened. What I just want to make sure of is that what I think the wetland line was, which was straighter and didn't go back out into the water, is what's being represented. So, so uh, Carol, Matt Hammer, Lamplex Engineering. So, uh, Doug called me about that conversation about the wetland flagging. You're right, those, uh, when we're out at the site, the trees had not been installed uh, yet at that time. I do know that um, the day after Norse Environmental um, flagged the wetlands, we went out and located that wetland flag because we had a short time frame to get those wetland flags on an updated plan for submission uh, to the commission. So there had been a few months that, I think it was April, I believe, when we were out at the site, if I'm not mistaken. So there was a, at least a month or two past when the flags were located by our firm and updated the plan to where the flags, whether they were moved or on a branch, or I know that there was a question about uh, water elevations at the time with the wetland flagging. And we do know that the, wet, the water elevations have been changing significantly in this area due to some um, beaver damming issues um, that's down gradient from the site. So I don't know if that had any impact on where the flagging was at the time we were at the site, but I do know that where the flagging was, we went out the day after North Environmental flagged that one. Okay, so, so that, that doesn't really answer um, whether or not it's, it's where I think the wetland should be, but maybe we could still take a look at that. I, it's not a big deal from the project standpoint, but because it, is a document that would be setting the line for the next three years. I'd like to just make sure it's accurate. And yeah, so, um, so sorry to interrupt you, Carol. So that was brought up. So I guess if something does um, occur within the next three years, uh, we could re readdress, you know, re um, go back and look at those wetland flaggings that possibly were in question and um, reevaluate those if necessary. Okay, and then for the commission, um, part of the reason I wanted to know what they were going to do for stabilizing, well, obviously, just to make sure it was going to get stabilized, but earlier on in the discussion, we had talked about the whole area around the buildings as not no longer being needed for access, 
and there had been some discussion of letting some of that naturalize and not be all grass grass the whole way around. So I know they're not doing the addition now, um, but they are doing the infill to create those spaces. I just want to make sure you're either satisfied with leaving it grass or that you wanted um, a more naturalized um, landscape area. If it's not needed for emergency access, I would prefer to have it renaturalized. So I, uh, Matt Hammer, Landplex, it's my understanding that that area um, was maintained in grassed and mowed so we could have access around the building. This is a very large building. Uh, we want to make sure that we can um, get around the perimeter of this building safely to maintain the building uh, and for potentially uh, fire department access. I thought you just said, Carol, we didn't need that. Well, the fire department had said that they didn't need it for access, that they could get to all parts of the building without having to go all the way around. That had been the discussion some time ago. And I think that they can still have access to the building for maintenance and still allow for um, a good portion of that area to renaturalize. Right, um, Matt, I don't have a scale to check. What is What are the distances between the building and the wetlands on the, um, I guess, behind the buildings and to the side? It's gotta be 20 plus. Right. Yes. So the distance um, is approximately 30 feet. So why don't we, why don't we, come up with a number that we want to renaturalize and leave them a some kind of space between that and the building so they can get in there if they want to do maintenance maybe i don't know 10 feet, 10 feet. what do you think could, i'm thinking 10 ask? feet from the building gives them their access and then from there on they should renaturalize yeah, yeah. Uh, eric could you just uh, are we talking about the area uh adjacent to the compensatory storage area or along what i'll call the right side of the building are you talking about the entirety of the building? You talking to me, Doug? Yeah, I'm just, I'm just, I'm, I, or Carol, whoever could just, I, I, we're talking about renaturalizing, and and then at least the initial part of the conversation was adjacent to and around the compensatory storage area. Is that what we're still talking about? Or are you talking about potentially reducing the the, the maintained area around the entirety of the building? That's yes, what I that's thought you were talking about. Well, remember when this building was approved, um, and you know it, it was it was that area, that thirty foot buffer around the building was defined. And in fact, I think at the time, you know, uh, Mike was supposed to uh, was able to fill and grass and create that buffer, and then that was to create the you know uh, the defined line. Um, which wasn't a wetland back then. Remember, the wetland has sort of grown or, or expanded to the edge of that, um, the edge of that slope. So I and and I mean, I guess I just what's the, you know, that seems like a lot to take a twenty foot strip around the entirety of the building away from them. Yeah. Well, what what what, what does he need it for, Doug? I mean, what does he need it for? I mean, you, you're talking about building maintenance here, and we're going to leave a ten foot so you can get back there and do maintenance on the building. I mean, we're trying to create more buffer to the wetland. The to wetland the, to is the resource there. area. I, I understand that. I do. Um, and and I, I guess maybe I would I would make an argument for, I, I don't know, 10 feet might be a little tight. If, if they got to get a truck in there to, you know, work on a siding or a roof or anything else, I mean, could could we consider something a little bigger than that? And you know, I, I I'm 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 interested. I'm curious to the to the fact that the fire department, who I will honestly say, usually always pushes us to maintain, you know, access around a building. Why they on this building? They're now saying they don't need it. I I well, certainly this haven't goes seen back that a long any, time. Any we've, been talking, done. we've been talking about it for two years, so I don't have the exact recollection, but that was something that you had proposed to the commission that you could naturalize the area. And we checked with the fire department and they said they could access the building from 
the parking lots and from other areas and that they didn't need it to go all the way around. That's that's my recollection. Yeah, because we originally uh, proposed as part of the addition that we were going to, you know, remove some pavement from the parking lot and naturalize the end of the parking lot. And, and we did, but recall, when we were proposing an 18 foot addition, we were keeping that full 30 feet, but that wasn't enough setback. So that's why the addition's not shown any longer. I, I'm not sure we ever proposed to naturalize around the whole perimeter, uh, but again, uh, we do want to work with the commission and we want to, to, to get this accomplished. I guess I'm just wondering, could, could, would the commission consider something a little wider than 10 feet? I mean, at least 15, that way we could restore 15 and, preserve 15. I mean, you also don't want vegetation and grass and trees and everything else growing up too close to the building. You know, I mean, just, because you know what's going to happen. It's all going to grow in. I know it is, and that's what we want to have, but we don't want to get, you, you just don't want too much thick vegetation growing up that close to a building. But, you know, I'd ask for your consideration in that. Could I, could I add one? Um, one one um detail to that is there a way i can share a screen uh, matt if it's fine with peter i think we should be able to yeah sure if, go ahead um, all right hold on one second matt yep So th this, can everyone see this plan? This was yeah. the mit mitigation plan? Yeah. So this mitigation plan had a detail that was taken off the original notice of intent that showed the 30-foot uh, section in the rear coming off the building and then sloping down to the uh, wetland. So I just wanted to bring that to everyone's attention. That was always a condition as a detail in why there's 30 feet behind the building and that's a gravel filled area in the rear in the rear and the side okay what do you guys think do you want to go with 15. i have no trouble splitting it you know i'm thinking if you gave them 12 feet that would be sufficient I mean, do they need 15? I, you know, I'm, I'm always trying to get more buffer than less. Yep. Any other comments from the commission? Okay. Um, so, Carol, do, do you want to go back out there one more time on these on these wetland flags, or or do you think you're all right for now to go forward with it? Um. I prefer it be shown accurately on the plan rather than us trying to condition it. And it may be accurate. I think Matt and I should look at that. Okay. So why don't we plan on doing that? Uh, yeah. Peter, if, yeah. if I could, um, I, you know, as much as I was hoping to wrap this up, um, I can appreciate that Carol wants to verify that wetland line. Um, and that will also give me an opportunity to sit and talk with Mr. Sheehan before I commit it to, to you, know, a, you know, a significant change in that, in that thing. Okay. So um, yep. uh, we will, I will meet with him. We'll discuss that. And, um, and that will give Carol and, and Matt an opportunity to, uh, you know, verify the wetlands. Let's make sure everything's perfect here. And um, yep. that way we can get back in and, and hopefully, you know, wrap this at the next, you know, at your next available meeting. Okay. Yep. Sounds good. Uh, any questions from the audience? I don't see any. Um, so we'll continue this meeting to uh, 722. Can I have a motion to that effect? So move. Second. Okay, all in favor? Eric? Yes. Jim? Yes. Margaret? Yes. Marilyn? Yes. Ann? Yes. Peter? Yes. Okay, thanks, Doug.
Well, thank you Thanks, very much Doug. for your time. We'll see you in a couple of weeks. Yep. Okay. Okay, we're going to move on to our next agenda item, which is a continuation of a public hearing for Stone Ridge Development, Greystone Pond, 3341666. They've requested a uh, continuance. So can I have a motion to continue this to our August 12th meeting? I'll move. Second. All in favor, Eric? Yes. Uh, Jim? Yes. Margaret? Yes. Marilyn? Yes. Ian? Yes. Peter, yes. Okay, uh, discussion items. Request for a certificate of compliance. Carol, can we do either one of these? Yes, we can do both of those. We're sat I'm satisfied. Matt did the site visit on Birch Hollow, but um, we're both satisfied to recommend certificates of compliance. Great. So can I have a motion to uh, approve certificate of compliance for Bandari 9 Ashley Place, 334-949, and Birch Hollow, 4 Nicole's Way, 334-1591? Second. All in favor? Eric? Yes. Jim? Yes. Margaret? Yes. Marilyn? Yes. Ann? Yes. Peter, yes. Great. Good. Okay, we're going to move on to our last item, which is uh, review the memorandum of understanding between the com Commission and Western Conservation Trust. And I know from the original document, Jim had some comments. Jim, you want to just go over those? For the record? Sure, yeah. I, I don't have it in front of me, but from the original document, I think there were nine steps proposed as sort of a draft um, sequence of actions before the um, legal defense fund money would actually be spent. And multiple steps of those uh, involved the commission um, contacting the, the, uh, the, the violator, explaining what was, what was the problem and what should be done to correct it, given the opportunity to fix it. And then only if that didn't happen and the commission was ready to proceed, we would then give the okay to Western Conservation Trust and then they could expend funds, um, a legal defense fund. The, I think there were nine steps listed in their original draft, and one of the steps in there I think we have to eliminate was the one um, where we would be uh, assessing fines or something like that, because with a CR, I, I guess I understand we can um, uh, we can bring them to court, but we, we don't have a uh, fine schedule to uh, to apply. Correct. Correct. Yep. I think and, and Jim, most of those, I think you also want to remember steps. we're the landowner in this case. We would be the ones in violation. All right. In, in every one of those. Yes. These are all. See, these are all lands that we already own, and we purchased them with CPC funding, and so it's required that they have a CR on them. And so we were. Right. We've asked the trust to hold the CR. Okay. And if somebody goes dumping on the property, that's what we're the, about. we're the ones responsible for dealing with it. Right, and we, and we will if we can through contacting uh, the, the violators. But then, at the end, what happens if, if we can't get somebody to clean up what they've been dumping over the fence or over onto the uh, onto the property? Then I think it's time for the uh, the legal defense funds to be used, right? The in the case, no, I, I don't think that's quite the case. If we were, if we own the land, it, it would be our responsibility to, to not have any violations. If we can't work it out with the, the third party that's doing it, then we would have to take action ourselves. Yeah, but I, I don't think that's, the, that's the purpose of this. I think the purpose of this is to provide that they would provide funds to go after the violator. That's how I take this and not us. If we failed in every way possible to try and get it done. Right? They, they, they would do a, uh, an annual inspection. First, we would have to have the boundaries marked. Then we would uh, have to have a baseline document. And then we'd conduct an annual inspection along with the, uh, um, with the Westford Conservation Trust. And if we find violations at that point, it's our property, if we find out who's doing it and what's going on. Well, we try to contact them and say, hey, you're violating uh, this property boundary. You're putting, uh, you're dumping debris on this area or that area. 
um, please remove it, get it out of there. You know, it's, it's not allowed to do that. And if they still don't, then I thought we were, um, that was the purpose for this uh, legal defense fund. Well, you're right in how they, they drafted it. How they drafted it, it does say in step eight, if legal action is deemed necessary for the failure to correct the violation, the Conservation Commission will notify that Western Conservation Trust will then initiate legal action using the funds provided for a legal defense fund. So that, that's what it said in their draft. Right. Um, when we had town council look at this, we didn't necessarily, we didn't, I didn't give them all these different steps. I just gave them the MOU. So. Well, the, the MOU just has the amount. It doesn't have any explanation of uh, what kind of steps or process goes through before right. that money gets spent. We went, we went, on, went back so. to the conservation trust and asked them to, and told them that, you know, we would accept their, you know, their, what they had proposed, but we needed to have a legal document and the MOU was the process for doing that. So this is what they gave us. Their attorney drafted it. Um, maybe they didn't give them all the steps. All right, I'm uncomfortable yeah. with uh, the, the way it was presented for tonight's meeting because um, that, that's town taxpayer money that we're handing over to a, a private organization. And I wanted to have clear understanding of when that money would be used and what it would be used for. And based on tonight's discussion, I'm less and less clear about what it's for. Or, and how yeah, I agree. I agree with Jim. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's not a problem. I'm just saying how it came about. Yeah. Let's come back. I'm not in favor of it right now. I voted for it back in February when we talked about it, but I, I thought it was to um, uh, provide that uh, the money so that it could be, so a legal process could be undertaken if need be to right. force somebody to correct uh, something that they violated. Okay, yeah, well, against the violator, not against the town. Yeah, so let's see if we can get the steps incorporated. It sounds like you'd like the steps incorporated in the MOU. Yeah, yeah. right, correct. Okay. And yep. make sure that the steps are the correct steps. Right, yeah. exactly. And that it involves uh, a, an okay by the Conservation Commission before that fund, those funds get expended. That, that was my critical aspect of it, because we may be able to resolve this any of these violations without legal legal action and i'd prefer to do it that way it's way cheaper and a lot faster correct yep but once we've exhausted okay. all those other means then we need to right. say okay western conservation trust go ahead reach into this fund we've established and you have and use the money to hire a lawyer or whatever i agree okay I yep so carol you you'll you'll send this back to town council yeah, I'll um, I'll give them the yep. steps and I'll ask them to yep. incorporate them. And if there's any um, conflict or any issue that they need to bring to our attention, I'll get it back to you. That's good. Okay, sounds good. Uh, anything else from the commission? No. Nothing. Okay, I don't see any other questions. Sorry, Marilyn. What? I just uh, noticed that we had one application from someone in terms of being interested in the commission. Have we advertised this, Carol, that we have an opening? Yes, it's been advertised numerous times in the town manager's newsletter and on um, other social media, I believe. So we do have one person, and we've scheduled an appointment for them to meet with you next oh, meeting. Yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you. I know that. Okay. okay. Yep. Great. Okay. Seeing no other questions, uh, I guess we can have a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor? Eric? Yes. Uh, Jim? Yes. Myrick? Yes. Carolyn? Yes. Ann? Yes. And Peter? Yes. Okay. Maybe I'll see you guys tomorrow. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Thank you.